good morning everyone and uh, it's a privilege to be here and i would like to start by saying a big thanks to the organizers for the invitation and uh, i'm glad to be here and looking forward to discussing connecting with you all so i'm debmalia beswas as the uh, moderator kindly explained and i'm here to talk to you about something called compositional ai so my focus is clearly on the enterprise side so when i was given the brief by the organizers that this is a focus the theme of the conference is on data fusion and how do i see the field evolving in let's say the next 4 or 5 years and with that brief and clearly in the enterprise context so i will try to share my thoughts around how i see the whole field evolving so we will go through some uh let's say some of the work that is currently happening and uh, there is actually a lot of work that is happening and maybe sometimes it's a bit too much we need to coordinate our efforts so i will try to present my uh, thoughts around this topic so let's start with uh, enterprise ai so enterprise ai by enterprise ai i mean the application of ai machine learning data science use cases technologies in enterprise context and uh, this has seen a lot of adoption and i think it's probably fair to let's say most of the use cases that are in production today we can broadly classify them based on the three core technologies so we have natural language processing we have computer vision image processing and uh, predictive analytics so natural language processing is basically the um, uh, the usual kind of chatbots it's mostly on text information text classification ticket classification and then the more value added services let's say like translations and um, and summarization computer vision has also been fundamental to the success of ai so with the rise of deep learning computer vision the field has matured and now we see let's say real life use cases of um, image recognition uh, object detection and uh, similarly optical character recognition which is kind of special and i will come back to that later which is a nice example of where we are able to combine computer vision with natural language processing to provide a uh, great insights that is greatly uh, that is greatly improving the business processes uh, side let's say and then we have predictive analytics which is kind of the whole data science getting insights from data so how do you use your sales data to make better forecasts Uh, recommendations as well where we are able to leverage how people are behaving to offer more personalized services to predict what they are looking for what consumers are looking for and so on and it's not only on the consumer side we also see adoption of this type of technologies in security so finding anomalies finding in case of industries let's say manufacturing side where we are able to successfully apply this to uh, things like predictive maintenance of machines so clearly we have made a lot of progress there is a lot of adoption uh, but where i think where the let's say the takeaway point for me from all this is that these solutions are still very focused every time uh, we get a new problem we start with a new team we try to solve them from scratch uh, of course we are using let's say whatever has happened in that uh, for that specific problem before but they are still focused on a specific problem so what do i mean by that let me come to uh, compositional ai so when we talk about compositional ai i'm usually trying to talk about a capability where we are able to uh, compose seamlessly compose uh, different services so uh, for instance uh, and let me give you a kind of concrete example to better illustrate what i mean and i think uh, at least you will have an idea of uh, what we uh, what i'm trying to get at so uh, as an example let's consider the you know an online repair service uh, launched by a, a luxury goods vendor so the idea is that someone is able to submit uh, that a consumer is able to submit pictures of uh, their damaged products and uh, the online service is able to give you quotes of you know what is the damage how much will it uh, cost to repair it and then uh, kind of automatically process the order let's say and underneath the service i mean you can imagine that there are let's say two services that are uh, uh, providing this so one you have a computer vision model which given a picture is able to analyze it identify the identify the defect and then 
once the defect has been identified and the code given, it is presented to the user and the user can either agree or say no, yes or no. And then the chat, and then let's say it's, um, the person is having an interactive conversation with the chatbot, which is recording the details, the address, uh, et cetera. The dem basically, the demographics necessary to process that order. So, I mean, the interesting part happens when, you know, so let's say this exists for some time, and now the company would uh, want to launch a new, uh, let's say, recommendation service. And recommendation service, as we know, is uh, basically, you know, you try to analyze what, the, what consumers are purchasing and which demographic of consumers are purchasing what products. And here, as you can imagine, actually, maybe somewhat surprisingly, the data that has been collected by the repair service holds a lot of value because it is additional data in terms of so you know what is the current state of the products that have been purchased by the uh, by the user, and you also know the uh, current demographics of the user. So this is basically an updated version of the data that you would have in your sales database, let's say. So you have very updated versions of, you know, so this product is maybe damaged, maybe you should try selling them something similar, a newer version. And you also have their, uh, uh, all of us who know kind of dealing with consumer DBs, the addresses, the demographics kind of get, uh, let's say, stale over a period of time. So this is very fresh new data. And ideally this data can be leveraged to, as additional data to train the recommendation service. Uh, of course, there are privacy uh, policies here which might uh, prevent this from happening. The consumers have shared their data with the repair service from the point of view of being just able to process their, uh, let's say, repair order. It is not meant to be used for profiling, and I will come back to the privacy aspect later. So going forward with that example, again, let's say, I mean, so we have another requirement, the enterprise has another requirement going forward. So. Uh, the online repair service was providing product repair at, uh, at uh, as an online service on the consumer side, but maybe the the uh, enterprise wants to roll out the same feature in their factories as well. So you can take the same computer vision model and put it uh, because it is able to identify defects in products. You can put it in your manufacturing pipeline where it is able to detect uh, defective products as they are coming out of the, let's say, the manufacturing process, the manufacturing machines. And uh, here again, uh, because the consumers have, the users have uh, you know, confirmed that uh, this is the type of, uh, let's say, defect that the product actually has. So this can be considered as training data in terms of ground truth or uh, golden records in terms of this is actually a picture of that type of defect. So again, this can be used as training data for a completely different purpose. And the whole idea is to be able to mix and match, let's say, so once you have a complex service or a composite service, which has, uh, which is already kind of composing different services, how do you take parts of it, whether it is in terms of uh, the APIs, the data or the models, and then form a new service out of it and to do this in a seamless fashion, taking care of uh, privacy, uh, lineage and other governance aspects. So. This is the goal. Uh, I will try to share maybe what has uh, been happening and how can we move this forward in a more cohesive fashion. So let's go. Okay, so I kind of already uh, discussed this. So compositionality is what we are looking for it and it is a fundamental capability and it's a kind of very powerful capability which is to form new services by combining existing services. And of course, uh, you can do this. Uh, this can lead to a hierarchical composition. You can do this one layer after another. So this is not new uh, because, uh, you know, for those of us who have been in the field for some time, we'll have seen certain variants of this in some form or the other. So for instance, when we were talking about web services or web services used to be kind of the, the new revolution, we have, we spent a lot of effort on web services composition. So web services, for those of you who are more used to APIs, these are basically self-contained services which provide, um, let's say a certain functionality. And the idea was to, uh, so there were quite a few specifications which tried to uh, form composite web services by orchestrating uh, the available web services into more complex ones. 
So the, the, the more composite web services, the challenges that were kind of considered is how do you discover such new services? How do you uh, match these new services? So basically do matchmaking of which uh, service, which web service can provide what functionality and how do you monitor, provide reliability guarantees and things for more such, uh, let's say composite complex web services. Uh, composition is also very much considered in the security field. Uh, it's still a hot topic of research where the whole idea is that given, uh, so let's say given a complex task, you are able to, you know, we are able to decompose it into uh, simpler tasks. And then if we can design uh, secure, so protocols which are secure for this more simpler tasks, uh, and then you try to compose them, the universal composability framework or something similar will ensure that the composition of two uh, secure uh, sub-protocols is also secure. And uh, this is, uh, the, the benefits are kind of clear. It ensures that any existing security protocol can be put in a new, um, let's say adversarial environment and it will continue to remain secure uh, providing uh, for a more uh, complex service. So clearly the benefits are clear and uh, these, let's say, lines of research are being pursued in different areas. Now, uh, let us come to maybe more of um, in a, you know, what's happening in the machine learning field. Uh, again, there are different variants which consider some parts of what I was describing. So for instance, uh, something that comes to mind is ensemble learning. So here the basic idea is that you are, uh, again, you you take your training data, you try to split it, and then you build individual models on parts of that data and so forth. And then you try to combine them. So in case of prediction, it can be, for instance, you try to average the predictions of different predictors so that you, you get a better estimate. <laughs> so, and similarly, in case of a classifier, it can be that you are trying to you know, incrementally uh, combine the outputs of the classificators so that you are able to get uh, you are able to get the best classification and uh, random forest is a good example of this where uh, it's an example of ensemble learning and uh, yeah some common techniques that are usually used here are bagging boosting and stacking i wouldn't go into too much details because i think uh, professor petro will probably cover that in much more detail in the next talk so i'm definitely going to catch on the next one and i would also encourage you to do the same uh, so from ensemble learning, uh, we also have uh, something that is coming up now called federated learning. Uh, so the way to differentiate, let's say, ensemble learning from federated learning would be, in that case, uh, the data basically, you know, we were splitting the data, but the data still belong to one organization. The whole idea of federated learning is to provide this capability to, to multiple let's say distrustful organizations who don't trust each other completely so that they are still able to collaborate, they are still able to work together to, to provide a new global model which has been trained on this data. So, I mean, uh, there's a lot of work, ongoing work, very current work on this on how to perform distributed neural network training in a federated learning setting. The whole idea again is that uh, you train your, um, let's say, so when you start, so each organization um, has a local uh, uh, architect, so local neural network that they are using to train their local models. And then there's a coordinator who basically acts as a parameter server. So the way it works is that, uh, again, all the nodes, so all the organizations at the start agree on the same neural network architecture and task. Again, focusing on the task and the same in ensemble learning as well. All these things are being done to create a global model, to create a very performant model, but they are focused on one task. So once you have everyone with the same neural network architecture and focusing on the same task during each epoch, as we know, a neural network training happens over multiple epochs. So during each epoch, the different nodes kind of download the global parameters, the global network parameters from the coordinator they update their local models, back propagation using some form of uh, gradient descent. Um, and then the shared values are again sent back to the, so the updated parameter values are again propagated back to the coordinator 
who in most cases is basically you can even average and then you get kind of the global parameter values and you continue doing this uh, till you reach, uh, of course, the model converges. And it has been shown that uh, such type of distributed neural networks can provide the same level of, um, let's say, accuracy, uh, precision, as compared to if you actually combined all that data and trained, uh, uh, you combined the data from the different organizations and trained the neural network on the on the data on on the whole data directly. So this is a very powerful model, but um, a powerful framework. But at the same time, it is still targeted towards. So the focus here is on really combining data that belongs to different organizations, but the. Uh, from a, let's say, task or a functionality point of view, it is still targeting one functionality. And there have been some uh, interesting work. I mean, here and there, not necessarily within a framework where you are kind of, uh, you know, ad hoc stacking of neural networks. So again, I mentioned OCR before, but OCR is kind of a good example where you are uh, basically, let's say, uh, stacking a CNN on, on top. So uh, you are kind of using a CNN first to extract the image features, the characters, and then you are using an LSTM or something like, um, or maybe transformers now to basically understand the structure of the, uh, let's say, the characters, and then you are able to better predict the characters in the, uh, in the image and which kind of gives uh, you a better OCR. So these things are happening um, not in a very organized way. These are more like hand-coded sequential stacking of uh, neural networks where you need a kind of expert to really stitch uh, these things together, focusing at uh, the neural network architecture level. So, okay, so we have seen quite a few things that are um, kind of happening uh, around the same topic, not necessarily doing exactly the same thing, but let's go back to the drawing board. So. At a very basic level, the functionality, the AI service that we are looking for uh, consists of three things. So we have the data, the training data, then you build a, you train a model based on it, and then you expose it as some form of API endpoints. There's also a new field where uh, like Edge AI, tiny ML, where you are actually embedding a trained model in a device where you can execute it in an offline fashion. But uh, let's say maybe that is a topic of presentation for, for a topic of discussion for another presentation. But focusing on more, let's say, this traditional um, pipeline where you have the data, the model, and the APIs. There also start to be, you know, so again, in a completely, I wouldn't say completely, but let's say there start to be different frameworks addressing different aspects of this from an operational point of view. So we have now data ops, which is more focusing on the data, ML ops, which is more focusing on the model part. And then there's no common term, but then we have API ops, API mesh, API management, however you call it, which is more focusing on how do you orchestrate different APIs. So let's consider them a bit more in detail and see if they can solve what we are looking for. So uh, when we when it comes to data ops, again, this is a very uh, kind of complex topic. And uh, what I try to show here is, let's say, the usual data flow that you would have in a in an organization when you're trying to establish, um, a, a, you know, like a, something like a central data lake, um, a data pond, whatever you call it. So it the basic idea is that you're trying to combine data from different sources and it goes through different stages of processing before you, uh, before you are able to get the, the valuable, the golden insights that you are looking for. And again, I put some, uh, the, as, so as a disclaimer, I put some, uh, let's say providers who provide those functionalities. This is not, there are a lot of other, um, let's say competitors, vendors who provide similar functionalities. So this is not a recommendation by any chance. This is not an architecture slide. This is more to illustrate the point that on the data side, we have reached a certain level of maturity where they start to be very production ready um, enterprise scale kind of products. So again, when you're trying to combine data from different sources in a central data lake, you would first ingest them, then you perform different, um, let's say data processing steps, which is usually to clean the data, check data quality, transform the data into a form that you need. And again, the more interesting part for, uh, for this discussion is basically the data integration part, which you can also call as data fusion. 
And I will come to that later. And the last part is uh, basically you expose that as an API, your dashboards, reports, or things like that. So again, the key part here is data integration. So, and again, the reason I mentioned that this is quite mature in a data ops point of view is that we have multiple ways of doing it. We have multiple tools to do it. So, so for instance, if we just focus on the data fusion or data integration part, we have federated queries where the basic idea is that uh, the data, so again, you're trying to combine data from multiple sources. The data remains in their individual uh, data sources. And at runtime, you're able to provide a federated query. The engine is able to delegate this query to the individual repositories, get the results, compose them, merge them, and uh, show the consolidated result uh, back to the user. Uh, similarly, we have the concept of data warehouse, which is kind of somewhat different. So this basically assumes that uh, you can Pre, you know beforehand what type of data you will need. So you will you are trying to basically build some type of data cache, data mart, and this is actually physically copying the data from the data sources and uh, building this data mart. So that's why the difference in the level and the direction of the arrows. And uh, finally, we have something quite interesting, which is also something that we will see in this conference. So uh, graph, uh, let's say graph and knowledge graphs, uh, and also its applications to neural networks, graph neural networks, these also start to uh, become like uh, quite interesting areas of research. And the whole idea here is that you are able to use graph structures to kind of understand the the relationships in your data. So again, we are talking about combining data from different sources and use this uh, relationship, knowledge of this relationship, the semantic relationships between the data to, uh, to uh, let's say, do better queries and get more insights. Uh, so the takeaway from this is that the significant amount of work that exists or is happening on the data side, but somewhat similar is missing on when we talk about, again, as a consolidated uh, uh, capability, when we talk about integration, when we talk about fusion on the model side, and um, again, taking into account the APIs, the models, everything together. Uh, so MLOps, again, I wouldn't, I mean, each of, so uh, I'm trying to handle them at a, you know, at a high level. So there's clearly, we can have, a, you know, the full kind of separate presentation on each of these topics. These topics are quite detailed, but, Again, when we talk about to give an idea of where MLOps is, I mean, this, uh, you know, came from when, let's say, uh, so from a software engineering perspective where you combined, uh, where you put an ML focus on the a whole DevOps practice. So again, it addresses the whole pipeline of uh, machine learning models. So the whole pipeline of uh, machine learning development and uh, deployment. The data aspects are there. Some of the data aspects that I described before as part of data ops. So how do you collect the data? How do you, uh, let's say, do feature processing? And so basically the data pipelines. And uh, kind of, uh, and then you also have the API side, which is more uh, in illustrated here as the serving infrastructure. You need to, uh, you know, monitor the machine learning models and things like that. So in a way, it is an end-to-end -end pipeline. And uh, I think this figure is kind of, uh, so the paper is quite uh, influencing, influencing uh, led to, you know, this kind of influence the work on this field because this showed that, uh, I don't know if you can see it, the ML code, the ML model is only a part of the whole process of enterprise AI, let's say. But even here where, uh, let's say, uh, ML uh, frameworks or ML ops frameworks are able to provide this capability in a quite mature fashion. It is still focused on one model at a time. <clears throat> so you are able to store model history, model parameters and things like that, but it is still focusing on one model at a time. If you want to do something like model fusion that I was showing before, it is not very clear which other parts of, let's say the data part can you reuse, which other parts of the serving infrastructure can you reuse, maybe some, but as of today, they are not, uh, let's say, let's say capable or let's say built in a way that uh, to accommodate this. So that's kind of the point that these, uh, let's say even from an MLOps point of view, it needs to, uh, it needs, we, there are certain things that need to be done to allow this uh, model fusion capability. 
And uh, coming, uh, so a bit more on API ops, I mean, maybe this is something that we are used to. So you expose a pre-trained model, a trained model as an API, and we, we see this more and more now from cloud platforms even. Uh, so the big cloud platforms where we have APIs for uh, doing different things. Again, they are a great starting point. Uh, so you have, uh, you're, they are easy to use. You don't need to know about the underlying models, the data which was used to train them. But in a way, that is also their limitation because yes, they are good to start. They are good for proto the initial prototypes, uh, getting a certain level of accuracy. But when it comes to your strategic use cases without knowing what data was used to train them and which models architectures they are using, it is difficult to see how they can be used for um, let's say your strategic use cases. And this brings us back to, let's say, again, when we talk about AI services, we need to consider all three things together. So the API data and models, we cannot separate them. Uh, so maybe, uh, so a couple of slides, I mean, we focused on more the operational side. So clearly on this stack, we focused on, uh, you know, the ML ops, the data ops and uh, things like that. But maybe there are certain things which come with discipline. So when we talk about model fusion, there are non-functional aspects as well that need to be, that need to be considered to make it a reality in enterprise settings. So there are two things that I would cover, that I would like to cover which more come from a governance framework kind of uh, point of view. So uh, we see more and more data governance practices. And we also see something kind of growing adoption, which we also saw a talk yesterday on ethical AI. And uh, we see kind of in, uh, let's say, enterprise AI uh, practices, we see more and more of this ethical uh, committees, frameworks, which are laying out guidelines for this. So how, does, how do these two things, let's say, impact the whole vision of uh, compositional AI or um, let's say model fusion, things like that. So again, let's start with the data governance. So it's more, <coughs> sorry, it's more mature. Uh, and it considers because of the whole kind of uh, uh, all the different uh, layers, it considers different aspects. So it's a broad term where we are trying to, let's say govern, ensure that your data is properly modeled you have a catalog dictionary of the different types of data that you have. And the most important thing, at least for this discussion, is that you are able to track the provenance of your data. So the origin of the data and how it is. So the lineage in terms of how it moves that is, as, it is, as it gets transformed at every stage. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, so from a data governance point of view, also there start to we see we start to see some principles, guidelines, frameworks. So I mentioned the fair principles here, which is seeing quite a bit of adoption in the in the medical industry, at least I would say. And again, the whole idea here is that to have certain principles when we are collect, gathering, processing data, so that we are clear on the lineage, provenance, how the data is made accessible. And the whole idea is to enable reuse so that we don't have, we know what the data is and we can use it uh, for a certain purpose, being sure of how that data was collected and processed. But again, here, this is kind of considering it from a, uh, let's say data perspective, but if we think, if we think of the models and, uh, you know, again, considering that the model is still considered as code and they are stored as software, as we see this kind of uh, lacking a bit, the, the, let's say the, you know, the integration between models and, and data. So in parallel, the, as I mentioned, so the models are considered as code, so they are stored as open source software. So the, you know, there's a whole framework around open source software licensing and things like that. And this doesn't go very well with the open data. So in a way, the open data frameworks are not working well with the open source software frameworks. And uh, yeah, this was recently highlighted in a uh, paper by Lamprecht uh, et al. And uh, I think I would recommend reading that where they kind of highlight, you know, how we can, uh, how we need to work together to move, let's say the open data together with the open source software. So which would also help as ML practitioners to move the models and the data together from a unified governance point of view. 
So uh, last couple of slides. So ethical AI, uh, as I mentioned, again, this is a topic that can be a whole discussion. Here we are focused on, you know, when we are deploying AI ML models, they are done in an ethical, responsible fashion. Some of the key ingredients are uh, privacy, which I will talk about, um, explainability. So ensuring that you can explain how your model reached a certain decision. The training data is uh, you are trained it on fair data, uniform representation of the different uh, categories and things like that. Uh, so let's focus on uh, privacy and uh, the whole idea of privacy. The reason I mentioned privacy as I was uh, giving an example before privacy becomes quite important when we talk about uh, end of the day, everything is based on data and it becomes especially important in a, let's say fusion um, a perspective. So uh, from a privacy point of view, uh, so clearly, again, you have the data, the model APIs, and uh, researchers have shown that even if an attacker has access to only the API, it can learn certain things about the training data set, which is maybe not too new. But what is more interesting is that even if they have access to the model and not, not direct access to the training data set, you can still learn some insights about the, about the data. So I wouldn't go into the details, but this has been shown quite clearly in a neural network setting, for instance, where a trained model may leak insights about uh, from on, on about the training data set, about its training data set, the data set on which it was trained. And uh, this basically comes from uh, from actually the back uh, from the back pro propagation process, where um, you know there's. Uh, you can show that there is a certain relationship between the gradients when you're adjusting the weights during uh, backpropagation and the features of that layer. And this becomes very evident when you have certain weights, um, when you have certain weights which are very sensitive to certain features. And so if an attacker knows only, so when you're sharing the model, you're sharing the model gradients. And if you can monitor this over different epochs, you can uh, infer uh, let's say certain features of the data on which it was trained. So synthetic data or even sharing a model may reveal certain aspects of uh, the underlying uh, training data. And this leads to, uh, let's say, privacy issues in, a, in a, especially in a fusion kind of uh, or a compositional context. So for instance, we are now moving towards, let's say there have been rulings which kind of say that once you delete uh, some data or a user opts out and you need to delete that person's data. You also need to delete the models that were trained on it. And you can imagine that this will get very complex in a compositional setting where you are kind of, you will need to know which data, let's say a higher level uh, model or a service was trained on to be able to enforce this policy. And the same applies uh, in the other example that I mentioned before where you you are allowed to use opt-in data, you are getting opt-in for a certain, uh, uh, let's say, uh, functionality. So something when you are getting user data for, um, for a completely different purpose, you cannot use it for profiling and things like that. And again, keeping track of this, enforcing this in a context where you have uh, hierarchical services gets very difficult and you need to have strong governance to ensure that you are capturing the lineage and the provenance of not only models, but models, data, and APIs together. So uh, I will try to conclude. Uh, I think this was more like, uh, you know, where, I, where we see kind of uh, AI data ML headed in the next five years. So I presented this, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, framework or vision of compositional AI where we see the seamless capability to be able to form, uh, let's say, composite services using, um, using uh, based on existing services. And the, again, the whole idea here is that it's not sufficient to focus on uh, data models and APIs separately. We need to form arbitrary compositions of them and that is what we need to enable. We need to consider them together, but at the same time being very clear of the components so that they can be reused independently if possible. And so just some key takeaways. So, so compositional AI, very powerful capability. We have, the focus is now more on data. Once we have, let's say the most performant models, we cannot squeeze any better performance out of them from an enterprise point of view, it would be how we can reuse this data. 
And same from, uh, so again, this needs uh, integration of different frameworks. The whole idea is to reduce rework. And uh, finally, we need to, to make this a reality. We will need to address non-functional aspects such as lineage and privacy as well. And with that, thank you once again. I hope it was interesting and I will look forward to your questions.